Loop 64 64.1, Jim Quirk Luke Skywalker peered at the row of droids the Jawas were offering. Looks like we're hosting guests. Asterisk. The negotiations for the droids had gone as usual, except he was now leading a gloss white 3P0 unit with pink and lavender highlights, and a pale yellow and bright red astromech into the garage for cleaning. The two droids were more subdued than their baseline versions. He wasn't sure if they were still trying to assimilate their new setting, or just politely waiting for a more private venue. This oil bath is going to feel so good, said the protocol droid. The voice was definitely feminine and had a distinctly youthful timbre. Since we're in private, I think we can drop the pretenses and get down to introductions. I'm Luke Skywalker, the first local looper most visitors encounter. Welcome to Tatooine. And I am Sweet 3PO, Equine Sorry, Force of Habit Human Cyborg Relations. And this is my counterpart, Apple D2. The yellow and red astromech beeped a mildly frustrated greeting. After a pause, the speaker emitted a series of garbled syllables that resolved into intelligible galactic basic. Darn translation software. Is this better? The voice was also a youthful female, with a mid-rim twang by way of an accent. Luke nodded. Much. He turned back to 3PO. You said equine. Um, yes. We're normally ponies. From Ekestria. Ah. I've heard of you guys, but haven't had a chance to visit yet. And I bet you've had a fair number of visitors who know this place amazingly well despite having never been here before. Yet. Yeah. It was kind of disconcerting until I got a hold of vids from the hub. It also explained some of the new variants that cropped up lately. So y'all want to see Leia's Hollow? Asked Apple. Please. The Astromica's hollow projector flickered to life and ran through the entirety of the message. Too bad. Doesn't look like Leia's awake. Variation in how the message is worded. Inquired Sweetie. Exactly. I was wondering why she didn't react to my color scheme, mused Apple. Asterisk. Yoda's hut. Dagobar, sighed Twilight Sparkle to herself. Her loop memories informed her that it was 19 years after the end of the Clone Wars. If she recalled the movies correctly, it would be another three years before anyone was scheduled to show up. Okay. I can either vegetate here, catch up on my reading, play with the Force for a bit, or... A stray thought combined with her recollection of the contents of her subspace pocket. I wonder... She started limping toward the pond where Luke would plant his fighter in a few years. Right. I'm in 900-year-old Yoda's body now, she reminded herself. I think I'll go quadruped. With a flash, she ascended and quickly reverted to the more familiar lavender unicorn. Much better. She trotted the rest of the way to the nearby clearing. After some awkward sorting through her pocket, she looked at the shiny new T-65C X-Wing parked next to the pond with mild satisfaction. I don't think Scootaloo will mind if I borrow this for a quick trip to Tatooine, um, wait. Her past experience suggested that the loop usually started at the same time the movies did. That usually meant Tatooine would be under Imperial occupation by the time she could get there, showing up in a Rebel Alliance starfighter would just be asking for trouble. Of course. I can go to Bespin and then arrange for a passenger ticket to Tatooine. Right. Now to fire this baby up and load the hyperspace coordinates into, the, Astro, Mech. She didn't have an Astromech droid. Scootaloo said that she'd asked Apple Bloom keep hers for when there was time to tinker with it. Xylom. Asterisk. So how long do your loops usually run? Asked Sweetie as the land speeder cruised toward the Jund land wastes. Depends. About half the time, it wraps after the Battle of Ender. But some variants can go as far as 40, 40 years after that. What about native loopers? You're replacing two of them, Arta much more often than 3PO, Leia, Han, and Chui, Ben less often, occasionally Lando and Wedge. No Imperials besides Dad and Mara. Thank the Force. 
Luke had had nightmares about the prospect of a looping palpatin. Or worse, a looping throne. My sensors seemed to pick up some banthesized life forms about 1,500 meters ahead, interrupted the droid laying on the back deck of the speeder. That sound about right. Yeah. It's about the right time and place to meet up with Ben, said Lucas Sweetie started slowing down. Whoa. Got a real big reptilian life form just beyond the banthas, and it's closin' fast. If those banthas are carrion sand people, they're runnin' to the north now. That's definitely not baseline. Take us southward, 3PO, and keep us behind that ridge, instructed the moisture farmer. A somewhat familiar combination of a roar and howl sounded, then a large reptilian form poked its head over the ridgeline that the speeder was now paralleling. It was a mostly purple head, with green spines. Don't think I've ever seen a crate dragon with those colors, observed Luke. Spike. Chorused the droids. Asterisk. After allowing herself five minutes of semi-coherent ranting, Twilight returned her thoughts to the problem at hoof. Okay. I need an FTL conveyance that will get me to a nearby star system with some sort of passenger service. Since I can't replicate Dash's self-propelled warp speed stunt, that means a ship, now do I have anything? She scowled as she ran through her pocket's inventory list again. It's definitely not ideal, but it might be good enough. More awkward manipulation replaced the X-Wing with a Starfleet Type 6 shuttlecraft. Fortunately, Apple Bloom had spared some attention to this particular ship in a past loop, so instead of the meager warp 4 top speed, Twilight had been assured that it could sustain warp 5.7. Now all she had to do was dig up Yoda's astrogation database, how else could Luke have figured out how to get to Bespin from here, and convert it to something the shuttle's computer could understand, chlorophyll. With an annoyed grumble, she trudged back to Yoda's hut, mentally composing a letter that she had no intention of actually sending. Dear Princess Celestia, Today I learned that I need to spend a lot more time on contingency planning for bizarre technology combinations. Your frustrated student. Twilight Sparkle. Asterisk. It was certainly shaping up as one of the more interesting loops in recent memory, Luke decided. One seldom sees a crate dragon shapeshift into a purple and green barabelle. You know. It's still kinda strange to see this place as a desert. One time I was here it was almost as green as Nabu. It made quite the impression, said Spiky One Kenobi absently as they went to the small cairn where he had left his Jedi robes and other equipment. Nabu. Asked Luke. Twenty odd years and a whole lot of loops ago. Friend of ours got stuck here for ten years and took up extreme terraforming as a hobby, explained Spike, shrugging into his robes and fastening the belt. Hey, Spike. Do you know if Anna Pony else is along for the ride? Asked Sweetie. I got just one magic when I checked earlier, and she's a long way off. Definitely not on this planet, answered the Jedi. Some of us have the ability to sense if others from our home loop are awake. It's, complicated. Apple Bloom said in response to Luke's confused expression. Do you want to drop by Ben's place to pick up Anakin's old lightsaber? Asked Spike, raising the hood of his robe against the sun's. Luke shook his head. He idly produced a pair of lightsabers from his own subspace pocket, then returned them. Experience does have its advantages. He glanced at the position of the twin sons. Anyway, if we make for Mos Eisley now, there's a chance we can link up with Han and Chewie and get off planet before the imps get their act together and set up their blockade in earnest. I'm the one who's all about avoiding imperial entanglements, agreed Spike. Let's go. Asterisk. It had taken nearly five hours, but the pre-flight checks were complete, and she had something resembling a warp-compatible version of a hyperspace route that should take her to Tatooine. She had indulged in another three minutes of berating herself for not realizing that a Federation shuttle would draw less imperial attention than an X-Wing. After ransacking the hut for potentially useful items, about 500 credits worth of old currency, and a Yoda-scale lightsaber, Twilight was more than ready to say good riddance to the slimy mudhole. 
Fortunately, the trip to orbit was uneventful, as was the transition to warp speed. The journey itself, living down to Twilight's expectations for the loop, was not at all pleasant. The good news was that the warp engines were behaving like a high-performance hyperdrive, so she would arrive much sooner than she had expected. The not-so-good news was that the intershield dampers weren't quite up to handling the subspace turbulence, so it was a very rough ride. On top of that, she had to make constant adjustments to the warp field. The practical upshot was the trip that she anticipated would take around 30 hours, during which she could have at least two six-hour blocks of much-desired sleep plus time to brush up on her force abilities, had taken 16 uncomfortable, concentration-heavy, sleepless hours. Now parked on the far side of the closest of Tatooine's moons fortuitously positioned in line of sight to Mos Eisley she deployed a pair of stealthed surveillance drones. Alpha would be tasked with patrolling Mos Eisley and its immediate environs, Beta was to scan the region around the Lars homestead and the Jundland wastes. Blessed with a few spare hours to allow the drones to reach their positions and collect enough data to create useful maps, she could take time for some deep Jedi meditation. I've gotten really rusty with this stuff, she scolded herself before going under in earnest. Asterisk. When Hannah Scoots Solo awoke in her bunk on the Millennium Falcon, she couldn't help squeeing quietly when her loop memories settled in. Yes. I'm Han rooting Solo. I'm gonna fly the Falcon. She had some previous experience with this setting, there had been a ponies only variant where Dash was in Han's slot, Angel was the Wookiee. Applejack got cast as the farmer, Rarity was Leia, and Twilight found herself as the semi-retired Jedi Master, facing off against an unawake Darth Nightmare. Scudolo had been relegated to Wedge's role, but at least she'd gotten a fair amount of stick time in an X-Wing. That had actually been pretty fun, even if none of the other CMC had been around for it. You seem happy, observed Pansy. Been here before? Before she could answer, a growl from outside the small room interrupted. Her loop memories handled the translation from Shiri Iwook. I say. Is that you, old friend, or do I have the honor of hosting a guest? Skudalo blinked. Who knew that Shiri Iwook was such a polite language? I'm afraid Han's not here. Chewbacca, I presume. She asked, climbing out of her bunk and opening the door. Indeed I am. May I ask who I have the pleasure of greeting? The Wookiee took in the young, violet-haired human female. Um, yet. Yeah. Name Scootaloo, Pegasus Pony from E. Kestria. Charmed. I believe we may have an acquaintance in common. There was a painfully earnest fellow with the name of Carrot Iron Founder Son who replaced our resident young Jedi once upon a loop. He had mentioned visiting your home in passing. It sounded lovely. Um, I don't want to seem rude, but is there anything immediate we need to take care of? If I understand my loop memories correctly, we're laying low trying to avoid Jabba's mooks until we can find a paying gig, right? Excellent. Straight to the point. You have the gist of our situation perfectly. I gather that you have some familiarity with how our baseline operates, yes? Assuming no significant variation, we usually bump into the young gentleman and his elderly Jedi mentor in about four hours. In any event, before I inquired as to your status, I received confirmation that Luke is awake, and will be bringing guests, both droids I gather. Alas, he also indicated that his sister does not share his status this time explained Chewbacca. Okay. I wonder who wound up as the droids. Is there time for me to take a good look at the ship? About half an hour before the first of Jabba's thugs start skulking around the area. Oh. I should mention that Luke has been showing up about an hour early in recent loops. It avoids the unfortunate altercation with Ponda Baba. Anything else you think I should know about? Ah, yes. If you were wondering about the incident with poor Greedo, I fear that there is no easy way to avoid it as he usually has Chaman staked out well before we can arrive. As you might expect, Han always gets off the first and only shot when he's awake. Scootaloo looked at the holster and gun belt coiled on the work table and suppressed a shudder. 
asterisk. Moderately refreshed by her trance, Twilight scrutinized the take from her surveillance drones. She was looking for an unobserved, yet open area to serve as a teleportation target zone. She had considered one of the unused docking bay in Mos Eisley, but had to reject them due to the control towers associated with them. Alpha was now looking at the outskirts of the spaceport town. There was a shallow canyon a couple of kilometers to the southwest that might serve her needs. Shifting her attention to Beta, the image of a dusty brown land speeder cruising toward Mos Eisley appeared on her screen. Zooming in, she could make out the white protocol droid and yellow astromech on the rear deck. She could make a good guess about the identity of the blonde-headed driver, but not the brown-hooded passenger. Ordering Beta to her planned canyon target zone, she established an atmosphere bubble spell around herself. She then left the shuttle and put its systems in standby mode, tucking it back into her subspace pocket. Finally, she carefully low grav hopped to a position where she had a line of sight to the planet. Looks like all that low orbit work I did when I was playing with XCOM is paying dividends. Concentrating on the image from the Alpha's camera, she teleported and found herself five meters above the canyon floor. A panicked levitation spell cushioned what would have been an uncomfortable landing. Retrieving the drone control unit from her pocket, she ordered Alpha to monitor the route between the canyon and the town proper. Twenty minutes until Beta is close enough to retrieve. I suppose I should at least make myself more comfortable while I wait. A chameleon cloth tent from her subspace pocket provided some shelter from the twin suns. Asterisk. Luke explained that the local garrison would be assigned to patrol, Mos Eisley while a detachment from Vader's Devastator handled the search for the droids. There was a narrow window of time between the Devastator's departure for the Death Star and the arrival of the three relieving Star Destroyers when the only orbital presence was a pair of antique customs frigates. The Falcon can and did run the more powerful blockade, but why make things harder on yourself if you don't have to? How solid is that time window? Asked Spike. Not as firm as I'd like, admitted Luke. Here comes the checkpoint. Would you care to do the honors? Despite Spike's mild trepidation, the encounter went as smoothly as anyone could have asked. Will you? murmured Spike as they cruised into the town. It's been a while since I've had to do that. Most of the time, I just need the battle precognition and telekinesis. They pulled up outside Chamun's cantina. Luke handed Sweetie a small comlink. They don't serve mechanicals, so you two might as well be the outer security perimeter. Since we're early, I think we can avoid most of the usual encounters. Got it, acknowledged the protocol droid. Watching the two biologicals enter the establishment, she asked her counterpart. How you doing, Apple Bloom? The astromech rotated her dome through three revolutions. This is pretty neat. I ain't done much time as an artificial life form, it's int arrested to experience it from this side. Cookie's still a little overwhelmed, though. Too bad those jump jets were removed, I kinda want to see how well I can fly. How about you, sweets? Clover's also trying to get used to all this. I guess I shouldn't complain but this body is more awkward than I'd like, and I suspect the baseline programming is what's behind the urge to mimic rarity at her most prim and proper. Asterisk. One side effect of Twilight's investigations of Silver Spoon's unstable species situation was a renewed interest in transformation spells. She had spent quite a bit of time with Fluttershy and Chrysalis trying to understand how their abilities in the area worked. While nowhere near as adept as those two, she felt that she had a solid grasp of the basics. It was time to put that belief to the test. There were very few sapient quadrupedal species in this galaxy, so trying to get past the Imperial checkpoints as a purple unicorn probably wasn't going to work out that well. Therefore, she needed to become a biped to better blend in. She could take on the form she had in the Canterlot High School universe, but she was feeling adventurous and wanted to try something a little more exotic. Putting the image of her desired new shape firmly in mind, she let the magic gather and flow around her. Several very uncomfortable minutes later, 
she examined the results in the full-length mirror she had pulled out of her pocket earlier. A lavender chwilek female gazed back at her. A naked lavender chwilek female. Well, at least it looks like everything's where it should be. She twitched a leku experimentally, then flexed her hands a few times, and walked several circuits around the tent's interior. Finally, she used the force to summon a few nearby pebbles to her. I guess it'll do for now. Sighing yet again, she started rummaging in her pocket for her limited selection of humanoid clothing. I hope my canterlet high blouse and skirt won't look too strange on this body. Next chance I get, I'm learning that instant wardrobe spell from Rarity and talking to Apple Bloom about holographic clothing projectors. Asterisk. Luke and Spike paused in the entry foyer of the cantina to let their vision adjust to the much darker interior. Good. Ponda Baba and Ivazan aren't here yet, so that's one annoying encounter avoided, murmured Luke. Another reason why you wanted to get here early? Asked Spike. Luke nodded and started a slow walk toward Han's usual booth near the back entrance. He quickly spotted Chewbacca who made the awake, with guest gesture. In a low voice, he told Spike, there's a substitute for Han. Might be a friend of yours. In his experience, it was very unusual for guest loopers to originate from more than one setting. The violet-haired smuggler took in the purple Barabel Jedi, then grinned. Spiky one Kenobi, I presume. Let me guess, Hannah Solo. A return grin. How ya doin' squirt? Hey. Only Dash gets away with calling me that. Chewie tells me that the droids are also along. Sweets and Bloom. Spike nodded. I also pinged one of the magics earlier, but I have no idea where she is. No time to do a more comprehensive scan and it might have alerted Vader anyway. Seeing friends together is always pleasant, no. Chewbacca asked Luke. Is there anything special happening? or do you want to go with the rapid departure plan? Luke's expression had gone distant. I, damn. One Star Destroyer showed up early. I think our best escape window will be in around two hours, but I'll need to spend some time tracking it to firm up that estimate. By the by, Scoots. I just spotted a green Rodian lurking over that way, muttered Spike with a faint head gesture toward a booth on the other side of the cantina. That one does not confront unless his quarry is alone. We could all depart together if you do not feel up to dealing with him offered Chewbacca. No. I got this, replied Scootaloo, her hand dropping to her holstered blaster. Spike raised an eye ridge, but said nothing. The two Jedi emerged into the baking double sunlight and made their way to the land speeder. Chewbacca was last seen headed for the back entrance. Any problems? asked Bloom. Not on our end. Scoot Solo, on the other hand. Said Spike worriedly. Greedo. Queried Sweetie. Spike nodded. To think that this is the first time some of you have been here, observed their host. Sorry. I think we've all watched the videos at least five times each, apologized the protocol droid. There was the faint sound of a single blaster discharge from inside. That doesn't quite sound like Han's DL-44, said Luke thoughtfully. A minute later, Solo emerged from the main entrance wearing a grim smile. It's amazing how many people forget these things have a stun setting, she said, patting the holstered blaster. Spike gestured at the two-seat speeder. We'd offer you a lift to the Falcon, but... I can walk, said Luke. It's not that far, and I certainly know the way. Asterisk. A brown cloaked figure rode a speeder bike slowly away from the checkpoint toward the row of docking bays. Since the stormtroopers instructions were to look for droids, a lone figure on a single seat vehicle was not part of their search profile, so a quick identity scan itself dispensed with by a quiet application of force persuasion was all she needed to enter the spaceport. To her mild surprise, Twilight had found a Jedi cloak that fit her new form remarkably well. Underneath, she wore a cobbled-together amalgam of a dark red Drasnian merchant's tunic, cocky slacks from a semi-casual pantsuit she'd picked up during a police procedural loop, 
and Starfleet uniform boots. Rarity would doubtlessly faint at the sight of her ensemble. She pulled up outside of Docking Bay 94 next to the weathered brown land speeder. She paused to run a hand over the starboard engine pod, but the heat of the afternoon suns made it impossible to determine how recently it had been shut down. Walking slowly into the docking bay proper, she stopped to gaze at the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy. Can I help you, miss? Asked a familiar voice. A youngish female human with bright purple hair, black vest over a white shirt, navy blue uniform trousers with red stripes, black boots, and a heavy blaster pistol in a low-slung holster emerged from behind a landing strut. She was pulling on a pair of grey-brown flying gloves. Twilight pushed back her cloak's hood, revealing her lavender-skinned head. Recognition dawned in the pilot's eyes. Spike. Someone here to see you. She called. It was obvious that Scudola was trying very hard to conceal amusement behind a cool demeanor. A purple and green barabelle wearing a brown Jedi cloak came down the passenger ramp and took in the visitor. A wide grin made more disconcerting by the mouth full of sharp reptilian teeth spread across the faintly familiar face. Spike made no attempt to conceal his amusement. He seemed to come to a decision and enunciated very clearly. Chwilak Sparkle, I presume. Scudalua lost her composure completely and collapsed against the landing strut in gales of laughter. Spike was little better, chortling loudly and clinging to a ramp support piston. I hate you two so much right now, was all the face palming Twilight could manage. Slash slash. 64.2, Zetrain. The sky was lime green, with purple swirls. The ground was flashing between chocolate checkerboard, yellow astroturf, and grass, as her spells kept trying to undo the chaos magic. The sun was locked directly overhead, with the moon orbiting it. Twilight woke up right then, in the middle of a shouting match with an oddly familiar white-bearded, brown-coated alicorn. The two of them stopped mid-rant, as their loop memories fell into place. A synchronized face hoof later, the two marched up to each other. Twilight, the alicorn asked in a familiar voice, why am I a pony? I don't know, Discord. She replied. You seem to have your usual powers, just, as an alicorn. You don't leave your baseline form often, do you? No. How do you get by without thumbs? I can't snap my fingers, and it bugs me. As he spoke, Discord put the moon back into its proper orbit. I'd say you learned to live with it, but I kinda had it the other way around. What were we fighting about, when we woke up? Yet old chaos vs order, I think. Twilight nibbled on some white chocolate checkerboard, the rest of the grass having been returned to normal. Yes, something droll like THA -A shout cut him off. Now, sister. While they are distracted. Is that? That is not stealth, Luna. Oh dear. They looked to the side, just in time for the flash of rainbow light to hit them. Asterisk. The two mighty alicorns, fought for control of the land. The Lady of Order clashed with the Master of Chaos, the lands, and very sky shuddering and twisting to their power. Finally, the two sisters brought to bear the most powerful magic known to Ponydom, the Elements of Harmony. Using the magic of the Elements of Harmony, they defeated the Warring Tyrants, and banished them permanently in the moon. The sisters led Ekestria into a new age of peace, and harmony has been maintained in Ekestria for generations since. The black unicorn looked up from the book, as she woke up. Well, okay then. Nix commented. Asterisk. They had not heeded the warning Luna's student had given them, and now they were about to pay the price. The festival was in full swing, they were surrounded by innocence, and the Lady of Order stood before them. She was asking about, what? An ID. You never revoked my citizenship, but I still need a proper ID before I can really do much of anything. You two are the only ponies that remember me, so I have to ask you to vouch for me. The pony at the office didn't believe me when I gave my name. The purple alicorn calmly repeated. And where is your rival? 
we will not allow you to plunge this land into another period of strife. Celestia did not allow her old enemy's manner to cloud her judgment. Over by the punch table. I think the mares are making him feel a little uncomfortable. A purple hoof pointed, to where the brown alicorn seemed to be hemmed in by starry-eyed mares. So tall. That beard. Centuries of experience, Rose, I'm telling you. That beard. Now girls, there's enough of him for all of us. That beard. Help. I need an adult. Discord tripped as he tried backing away. As he fell onto his back, the mares descended in a chorus of girlish cheer. Asterisk. Months later, they had finally convinced Celestia and Luna to allow them to release the statue that had taken Discord's usual place in the gardens. Who it was, was both amusing and confusing to them, until they heard the name of the statue itself. Thus, they were gathered alongside the elements, to free the mare known as Obsession from her prison. Looking at Cadence's perplexed stone face, Nyx lit up her element to cast the spell. Slash slash. 64.3, Indolatio. As Scudalo awoke, her loop memories were telling her that she was in for a great time this loop. She was a world-famous astronaut, she'd written her own book, she was running for governor of Kentucky and she was a giant chicken. She tried saying what, but what came out sounded like block. Asterisk. Reporters had gathered around Ms. Scooter Scoots Boo as she gave a short Q&A session on a stand in a public park. One reporter spoke up. Ms. Boo, what are your plans for revitalizing the economy? Block. That sent titters of laughter through the crowd. Seriously, though. The reporter continued. Bach, back off. Thank you, next question. Said an aide to Scudela's right. Ms. Boo, what's your opinion of the situation with the Ruskies? Scudela lowered her head and responded solemnly. Bach, walk. The crowd responded appreciatively. Thank you, next question. A third reporter stepped forward and in a thick southern drawl, asked. Ms. Boo, I heard you're a giant chicken. Care to comment on that? Shock ran through the crowd, and the rest of the reporters turned on the last question giver. As all attention was being given to the altercation, no one noticed a frisbee flying in the direction of Scudalo's head, and knocking her wig off. The fracas paused, realization coming over the crowd. They now turned her attention to her, with Scudalo holding up her wings in a placating gesture. She is a chicken. Get her. Asterisk. Scudalua dusted herself off. Her popularity in the polls had taken a nosedive and she'd suddenly found the need to disappear. As she walked off into the sunset, she wondered if maybe a trip to Hollywood wouldn't be in order. Slash slash. 64.4, Goldhood, Wing 0032. Exterminate. Twilight looked behind her and sighed. Trixie, you're not a Dalek. Exterminate. Doctor Who is a read-only loop. Exterminate. Your costume is atrocious. I can see your blue legs. Exterminate. This isn't going to get Doctor Who to Twilight was cut off by Trixie sticking a plunger in Twilight's face. Stop that. She took the plunger with her magic and disintegrated it. Look, Trixie. You going around dressing like a Dalek is no suitable replacement for not being able to go to the Doctor Who universe like a normal looper. Exterminate. If you say that one more time, I'm sending you to the moon for a week. Dot dot dot. Dot dot dot. Dot dot dot. Good, now. Extermi. Asterisk. You will be deleted. What the looking back again Twilight side at what was approaching her. You will be deleted. Chrysalis, you are not a Cyberman. You are not even a Cyberpony. You will be deleted. Chrysalis, your costume is as bad as Trixie's. Your horn and wings are sticking out of it. You will be deleted. You know as well as she does that Doctor Who is a read-only loop. You will be deleted. Doing this won't make Doctor Who loop either. Delete, delete, delete. 
Chai's Alice chanted repeatedly in a monotone Cyberman voice, while pointing the Cyberman laser at her face, which was nothing more than a flashlight with a blue lens repeatedly flashing at regular intervals. Stop that, she said, by moving aside the hoof of Chrysalis armed with the laser from her face. Delete, delete, delete. Look Chrysalis, you going around dressing like a Cyberman is no suitable replacement for not being able to go to the Doctor Who universe like a normal looper. I had told Trixie that, just stop it. Delete, delete, delete. That's it, if you keep going, you're going to spend a week on the moon with Trixie. Dot dot dot. Dot dot dot. Dot dot dot. Great, now get rid of that CO. You will be dealy. Asterisk. You too, ha. Huh? Trixie asked, as Chrysalis materialized next to her. Chrysalis nodded, pulling her costume off. Why didn't you just shapeshift? The changeling shrugged. Didn't feel like it. Slash slash. 64.5, Oath to Oblivion. It was a tense battlefield, the spirit of chaos versus the bearers of harmony. And just what can you silly ponies do now? Asked the Draken Equus. Your elements of harmony are useless now. And not yet. Declared the bearer of magic, who attempted to keep her conical hat steady on her white mane. We still have one more card to play. Discord arched an eyebrow and by arched, I mean turned his eyebrow into a stone arch. Oh really? I'd love to see you try to use such a card. Trixie grinned. Trixie warns you, you asked for it. Do it now, girls. Honesty. Laughter. Loyalty. Generosity. Kindness. Magic. Go harmony. The rainbow of light formed releasing something from the combined power of the elements. Specifically, a certain purple alicorn with a starburst cutie mark and crown. By your friendship combined, I am Princess Harmony. She declared. Before face hoofing. No, 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 I can't do this, this is stupid. Cut. She yelled to the camera crew, who stopped filming. Ah, come on, Twilight. Making movies is fun. Said Pinky. I'm not denying that, Pinky, but this is just a Captain Planet ripoff, with ten times the cheesiness. So. Give me the script, at the very least, I'm editing this so it sounds more like something we'd all say. Well, if no one needs me right now, I'm going to head over to Max Bar, I'll see you later. Waved Discord, as he teleported out. Twilight rolled her eyes. Right, like he's actually going to go there. Okay, now I was thinking. Slash slash. 64.6, Tricorn King. Fluttershy awoke to find herself in her cottage. Checking her memories, she smiled as she confirmed that this seemed to be a fairly baseline loop, at least so far. It was the day before the summer sun celebration which meant that Twilight would be arriving in just a few hours from Canterlot. As she went down the stairs, idly wondering whether Luna was awake this loop and what they would all do with Nightmare Moon if she wasn't, Fluttershy heard a strange sound coming from her kitchen. Multiple sounds, like small voices. Fluff. Fluff 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 f fluff fluff fluff. Fluff. Fluff a wuff a wuff fluff. There was the sound of two smacks and a third voice, sounding deeper than the others, said, Fwuff up. Fuffa wuffa waff fwaff. By now extremely puzzled, Fluttershy pecked her head into the kitchen. There on her floor were four extremely fluffy, short ponies, about the size of the cutie mark crusaders. One was light blue, the second was pink with a yellow mane, and the third was pure white with no mane and a brown beard something she'd once heard Twilight refer to as a Lincoln chin curtain. Off to the side, the fourth brown one was having a staring contest with a very confused Anjali bunny. Except for the white one, they all had noticeably large buck teeth, and rather large than average ears. Um, excuse me. Fluttershy said before they could start fighting again. Try as she could to remember, 
none of her loop memories had anything related to these four strange ponies. Startled, the four fluffy ponies looked up at her. Glaring at his companions, the bearded Fluffy walked up to her and cleared his throat. Fluttershy immediately recognized it as the third voice she'd heard. Fwuffa ba 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 fwuff. Cocking her head, Fluttershy just stared in confusion. I'm sorry, I don't understand you. What language are you speaking? The bearded woolly pony frowned for a moment. Sitting down, he began tapping the ground a bit with his front hoof. Just then, Fluttershy swore she saw a light bulb appear above his head, and the bearded woolly pony jumped up in the air, shouting, You're fwuffa. Standing on his hind legs, the pony began rubbing his front hooves over his throat. As he began speaking, Fluttershy wasn't quite sure, but she thought she heard the sound of a radio changing its dial. Fwuff, Baba Baba, C.A. Kafwuff, can you understand me now? Though still confused, Fluttershy nodded. Yes, that's much better. Who are you? If you don't mind my asking. Not at all my dear, said the white Fluffy, smiling at her. Just a second though. Turning towards his companions, the bearded pony walked towards them. Saying something in their strange language, he began massaging their throats as they spoke, until each of them was able to speak Fluttershy's language. To her surprise and mild disapproval, their leader slapped the brown one to get him out of his staring contest with Angel. Strangely though, the brown one just laughed as his leader massaged his vocal cords. Bringing his friends before her, the leader cleared his throat. Please excuse us. We're not used to being able to speak like humans. Humans? You mean you're loopers? The leader nodded. We could be. We usually inhabit a human world though, and we certainly don't look like this, he gestured towards his body. Though the buck teeth and long ears are a bit of a relief. Oh. So, who are you exactly? The sounds of an Oompa band started playing, and Fluttershy and Angel watched as the fluffy, woolly ponies began to sing. Ooh. We are the fluffs. Boom boom, good moon of fluffs. Boom boom. We are escapes from nightmare land. Our nightmarish queen doesn't understand. We just can't horrify or terrify. Can't even work up a fright. We just get laughs when we go boo in the night. When fluffies are good, boom boom. They're misunderstood, boom boom. Though we may separate. Or come in clumps. We get so blue. Cause when we say boo. Nobody jumps from fright. Before we awoke, explained the bearded pony, we had just managed to escape from Nightmare Land. Or what you would call the moon. The Nightmare Queen is planning to invade your land tomorrow with a great army of nightmares. She is using our people as her warriors. I sty don't see why we need to get involved, said the light blue fluffy. We we awake now, wet these big pony star with it. The bearded fluffy growled, you remember our baseline? How a thousand of you used robes to tear the continents apart, just so you could have a continent of your own. Shaped. Like. Us. That was when you all were still stupid. Imagine what our fellows are like now, in these smarter pony bodies, with the nightmare's powers. At the last part he was shouting at them, smacking each one in a row not unlike in a Three Stooges routine. Um, excuse me, said Fluttershy pointing at the leader, but why are you the only one without a lisp? The leader sighed. Because in our baseline, I'm actually their smarter ancestor. Which means that I'm apparently the loop-ordained guardian of these nitwits. Ooh, nits. Said the blue fluffy. Ooh, twits. Added the pink one. I wonder what's for dinner. Said the brown one. All three then looked at each other and just burst into laughter. Looking from them to Fluttershy, the bearded Fluffy sighed. See what I mean? Fluttershy raised a hoof to politely cover the small smile on her face. While she did sympathize with the leader, she couldn't help but find them cute and amusing. They vaguely reminded her of Pinkie Pie at her most outlandish for some reason. Well, 
My name is Fluttershy, and this is Angel Bunny, Fluttershy said as she pointed at herself then her pet. While I'm not the anchor here, I'd still like to welcome you to Ekestria. Our anchor, Twilight, should be arriving in a few hours, so we can meet her at the library and you can tell her what you told me. The bearded Fluffy gave her a warm smile. Thank you Fluttershy. My name is Cave. As for my friends here, they are Rose, Claire Blue, and Brun. Asterisk. So, first time visitor. Asked Twilight as she walked towards her library. Pinky had introduced her to a new guest looper. He was a light brown earth pony with orange hair, wearing a purple hoodie with a red trim and a white circle around his barrel. On all four of his hooves were white sneakers, though Twilight suspected the ones on the front hooves were more like gloves than shoes. Oh yeah. It's actually kind of nice. Still feels weird having limps connecting my hands and feet to my body though. Same with the neck too. The guest looper revved up one of his forelegs, and swung it hoof up in the air. To Twilight's surprise, it stretched out a few feet above them like rubber before coming back down. Glad I can still do that though. Well this should make an interesting loop, thought Twilight to herself. As she opened the door and let him in, she heard Fluttershy's voice calling to her. Just a second Fluttershy, I want you to meet a new guest looper. Before he awoke he was Ray Shine. As she saw Fluttershy walk up to her, Twilight turned to their guest. But I'm guessing that's not what you want us to call you. Smiling, Ray Shine shook his head. Please, call me Raymond. Just then they all heard a crash. Turning to the source, all three ponies saw Cave in front of a pile of books. One by one, each of the Fluffies rose from the pile, staring straight at Raymond. Way, man. Said Claire Blue. Something in the way those three Fluffies looked at him set alarm bells off in Raymond's head. Why yes. All three Fluffies in the book pile suddenly drew out giant plungers. Their bodies started shaking. Their eyes turned red and they roared out bay a a a a a a a a a a a before charging at Raymond. Slash slash. 64.7, Zetrain. Now was the hour. Luna had prepared for this moment for loops. Careful planning, stockpiling critical materials in her pocket, entire loops spent designing and learning with Apple Bloom, all of it had come down to this moment. Standing at the head of her bat pony army, she saw her sister's forces arrayed against her. Her still moon hung where she had stopped it, four days prior, and now, as the sun entered eclipse for the fifth time, she made her play. Hear me, E. Kestria. Soldiers of Celestia. My loyal followers. For too long has the night gone unappreciated. For too long, ponies have looked to the darkness in naught but fear. For too long, have they looked upon I as the embodiment of that fear. No longer, say I. If Ekestria does not want me, then I shall hold no loyalty to it. I shall seek my own nation, free from its prejudices. At sunset, I shall take those loyal to me to forge a new nation. Further, I shall take with us the moon that Ekestria so scorns. Hear me, sister for I shall not be swayed from this course. On the longest day of the thousandth year, I shall return. Farewell. As Luna turned away, the echoes of the royal canterlet voice fading, one could have heard a pin drop from across the field. Asterisk. Celestia was worried, for both her sister and those that had followed her. True to her word, those loyal to Luna had gathered around her, bringing families and supplies, and as the last rays of sunlight left the sky, the thousands of them vanished in a massive flash of teleportation. That had been a year ago, and despite her best efforts, she had yet to find a hint of where her sister had taken her ponies. During this time, the moon had hung right where Luna had left it. That was the one thing that gave Celestia hope, Luna still held the moon, thus Celestia could not move it. As she thought of her sister, she found herself sitting on her balcony, gazing at the moon. It was because of this, that she noticed the moon start to turn in place. As it turned, 
her quinolicorn eyesight started to make out something that had previously been hidden on the other side of the moon. As she began thinking of how to investigate, a series of bright lights lit up across the moon's surface, and the moon stopped turning. Asterisk. Hydroponics, check. Atmosphere, check. Hab blocks, check. Navigation, check. Engines, check. Waking up four years before Nightmare Moon? Check. Your Highness. Braking maneuver is complete, rotation successful. Engines standing by. Luna had spent the past years setting up to make the moon habitable, building the framework their nation would need. The rest of the moon was simple, compared to the engines. Even with the designs done, and the reactors already built, it had taken the past year to actually build the engines. But they were ready on time, with a full month to spare for system checks. Very well, engineer. Luna took off her crown, replacing it with a plumed bicorn. Pass the word, henceforth I shall be known as Captain. Engage. And with those words, the moon sailed into history. Slash slash. 64.8, El Magnifico. Macintosh was going about his routine absent any distractions or great disturbances. Twilight was off doing something new with, or was it to, the Griffins, Apple Bloom and her friends were entertaining themselves with boats off the west coast, and so far as he knew no pony else was awake. He made his way across one of the acres fields, the drag of the plow and strain of his muscles to maintain the motion a familiar, comforting weight. He focused on keeping the furrow straight each step adjusting his aim to the pull of the fertile soil. There was nothing to watch, no one to observe. Just him and his chores. He might, therefore, be forgiven for not noticing the Pegasus until she touched down beside him. The dainty thuds of her hooves on soil got him to pause and look up. He tensed internally, as he couldn't place her face or cutie mark in any of the various residents Ponyville cycled through as the loops added changes. There were a lot of them, but this was a new one on him. She was an oddly colored one too, primarily very dark purple with a white stripe extending from the tip of her snout, between her eyes and what looked like into her mane and along her back as well. The very not tribal stylized halberd on her flank and the orientation of the coloration, not to mention her wings, marked her as a pony rather than a zebra but he wouldn't put such a mistake past some of the canterlet fops or a few of the residents of Ponyville. Hello. Her voice held the promise of authority, but there was something held back about it as well. Playing her cards close to her chest. He inclined his head, eyebrow quirked to ask what she wanted, although he could take a guess. Twilight Sparkle told me you have a bar where loopers can go to cool off. I'd appreciate that. Turned out the guess was correct. Eyup. Give me a minute to finish this and I'll be right with ya. As they made their way towards the storm doors that opened into the Apple family's basement, she shook the dirt off her hooves. He was about to tell her not to bother, the space he used for the bar when it wasn't a large public establishment was dirty already, but she spoke before he could. Why do you do that? Do what? Plow your fields. Surely you know by now how to get that to go faster, even without breaking baseline. It's a routine. I've always been a pony that larks things to go smooth. Never been the adventure type. Workin' to help my family is what I done for the longest time. Even if they don't need lookin' after, ta process is still a comfort. One of the nice things about the loops is ta good don't need to change less and I want it to. He turned a knob and let the gas lamps Apple Bloom had installed before she left light up the room. The place was small in no way suited for a clientele larger than twenty ponies, but it kept that homely feel. What'll ya have? Do you have any Fuji Mountain Cider? He grunted. That was a brew from pretty far afield, but this was not the first looper to have a specific drink in their pony memories that reminded them of home. What did y'all say your name was Egan? You can call me Rose Eyes. He nodded, which she took as both affirmation and a prompt. I hold a position of authority, somewhat, in my home loop. The ponies there look up to me, 
at least in the baseline, and I act as their mentor figure, keeping a firm grip on the situation and trying to steer them to better lives without being too overt. I'm not the anchor though, and one of my students is. They have, obviously, grown beyond needing my help. There are, however, a great many of my subjects that still depend on my guidance. She sighed, and took a long swig of the cider. Sometimes, though, I wonder. Am I doing the right thing? Who am I expect them to pass my tests if I never even tell them I'm watching? They trust me to do my best for them, but there are times I've had to keep information from those I am supposed to help, to lead, and sometimes it eats at me. Should I be more blatant, give them better tools, more information to base their decisions on? Or would that simply stifle their growth, leaving them dependent on me? He paused. That was a doozy, to be sure. A leader needed to do many things. Doing those things and remaining visibly the leader and paragon were hard. Well Rose Eyes, I'd say you're not being a bad person. Few Mets, I do much the same thing around here, though no pony expects me to lead them. He winced. That wasn't the most well-considered of remarks. Helping loopers was hard, they remembered your mistakes. Sorry, that was out of turn. She nodded, but it was less a relaxed nod and spoke more of terse acknowledgement. He kept his sigh internal. Talking was difficult when you only had one shot at it. Nothing for it but to forge ahead. From my perspective though, I would say the problem is ya mix authority with your teaching, and teaching with your authority. Ya got two jobs, one to lead them and show how they should act, and another to make sure they follow through. Seems like the first should lead into the second, and if they don't learn by watching that's their fault. Take that and with a mighty large grain of salt though. I won't claim my wisdom's the best. I am no Princess Celestia. She smiled, albeit just a little, at that. He could see a small frown trying to pinch at the corner of her eyes though. Rather than leave her with whatever sour thought might be fermenting there, he continued. My own sister once said, why can't judge some pony by the disasters they avert, even if important stuff would have been learned if some hair got burnt. Whether you bane more free with and your information would lead to that oh are a bunch of ponies what can't think for themselves, I don't know. I try to adjust what I put out to get others to make their own conclusions, but my help in sometimes makes new problems. Really all I've found you can do with that is try and do better, or at least different, next time. Maybe it would have been better to hold his tongue. A joke? Something to lighten the mood? This was all like some sort of weird balancing act. I don't believe in inflicting harm on no pony to teach them a lesson. On the other hoof, some ponies will only learn to turn a knob once they stub their nose on the door a couple times. But what do I know, I am just a farm pony moonlighting as a bartender. This was getting him nowhere. What could he do? Outside of that one loop, which while not blatantly unpleasant he'd rather forget, there really wasn't much in his experience he could relate. Some pony else's? He ran down a list of the other loopers he'd had conversations with. None of them had come asking advice on this particular matter, but therapy wasn't the only thing he catered. He'd have to rely on third or fourth hoof experience, which was not as useful. Well, there was that one story. Twilight Sparkle had once told him about a loop, long ago, where she'd called Princess Celestia herself on just this. Wait. To his credit, Macintosh did not immediately fall down, prostrate himself, or otherwise align his body more closely with the floor. Instead he tensed, both externally and internally. He tried to school his features, but the mask he'd worn for a long time was best suited for work at a distance. He'd never had to hide from an alicorn from this close a range. She sighed. And here I thought my disguise was rather well put together. I even picked someone from another loop to imitate. Macintosh, I've told the others they don't need to bow and scrape to me. That applies to every pony that lives here, even you. He gulped. Ee yup, but that and don't account for all ta time off spent as one of your subjects, your highness. 
another one of those frown-pinched smiles. Before he could put his foot in it again, she spoke. You don't swear like the others. He raised an eyebrow. Not needing a prompt, she continued. You say few mets, or other appellations for things that belong in a restroom, rather than parts of plants. He considered that. Force of habit, I guess. Never did swear by you, your majesty. Would have been disrespectful before, didn't see the need to switch. She shook her head. Macintosh, you can dispense with the majesty. You've been in my place, more or less. After that, I think we can talk on equal ground. He resisted the urge to stomp a hoof out of frustration, or perhaps just irritation. Bad bar etiquette, not to mention disrespectful. That's what I've been, your highness. Not what I am. You're still the princess, I am still a farm pony. She seemed to consider that for a moment, and then smirked. Then as your princess, I order you to not refer to me as your highness or similar every other sentence. He opened his mouth to protest, and then shut it. He couldn't think of anything to say to that. Not at the moment. In lieu of thinking, he poured himself a flagon of the Fuji Mountain Cider. This was going to be a long one. Slash slash. 64.9, Chris Overstreet. Luna awoke, and was pleased to find herself not on the moon. Instead she found herself in a stately manner with only her young ward Twilight Sparkle and loyal butler Spike. Strange, but much more comfortable than most loops, she thought to herself. Then the loop memories kicked in, and things became rather less comfortable. A thousand years before Celestia's penchant for practical jokes had spiraled out of control. In the end Luna had been forced to use the elements of harmony to seal her in the sun. Distraught, Luna had abdicated her throne not long after, retiring to a country estate on the slopes of Mount Cantor while a new ever-free republic rose in the new capital of Pony City. That retirement had lasted for not quite the full millennium. Celestia had returned as the Solar Troll, an insane criminal mastermind whose crimes revolved around practical jokes. In the meantime the ponies had pretty much forgotten that the reclusive but generous pony on the mountainside had ever ruled the country or raised the sun or moon. Instead she was a frilly socialite, attending charity gatherings, fundraising for worthy causes, and pretending she didn't keep a sharp eye on the truly vast network of investments and companies Luna possessed. All of which was well and good, Luna thought as she reviewed her memories, but what followed next seemed rather silly. Silly, but fun. A red phone under a serving glass began to flash and ring. Luna levitated the glass up and answered the phone. Yes, Commissioner, dot dot dot. She has? We'll be right there. Bat poles. Twilight Sparkle asked. Bat poles, and not a moment to lose. Luna replied. The solar troll just robbed the Republic's gold reserves and replaced all the bars with Twinkies. Holy carbohydrates! Twilight gasped. If Pinkie Pie found out, she could devastate the nation's economy. Just so. To the Batmobile. Moments later, two ponies under disguise enchantments, Luna's strongly resembling Nightmare Moon, sat in a large black car with an open top. Luna. Twilight said from the passenger seat, I think this loop is going to be hopelessly silly. Just so. Final checklist, Luna said. Reactor online, Twilight replied. Batteries at power. Turbines to speed. Roger, prepare to depart, Luna said, looking over the car's side to the trio of musicians. Vinyl Scratch plugged her guitar into the amp. Octavia's bass was already plugged in while a third pony neither of them recognized brought a trumpet to her lips and played a quick riff. As the Batmobile blasted off in a squeal of tires and a roar of flame, hard-driving guitar music followed, along with voices singing. Batmare. Batmare. Batmare, Batmare, Batmare. Nana 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 nana